Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, an internal medicine and rheumatology specialist. Today, I'm sharing with you a fascinating story of a middle-aged woman who came to the hospital with unusual symptoms. Her medical team was at a loss, unable to pinpoint the underlying cause. That is, until they asked the right questions and ordered one simple blood test to confirm the diagnosis. I want you to learn how to think like a doctor. So let's dive right into the video and together we'll unravel this medical mystery. Meet Jennifer. She's a healthy, active 54-year-old woman who's currently training for a 5-kilometer run. Over the past few months, she's been having increasing fatigue and some knee pain, but she figured it was from all the extra running she's been doing. The pain then spread from her knees down to her shins and to her calves, so she decided to run a bit less and stretch a bit more, but the pain kept getting worse. Then she started developing bruising at the back of her legs, but she didn't remember bumping into anything. Even more concerning, she started developing these tiny red dots on her legs, but they weren't itchy, they weren't painful, so she didn't want to bother her doctor about it. She was hoping the rash would go away on its own, but it just kept getting worse. And over the course of two weeks, her legs became so painful that she was actually having difficulty walking. And at this point, her family convinced her that she had to go to the hospital. When she arrived at the emergency department, her heart rate was a bit fast at 103, but her blood pressure was fine and she didn't have a fever. She's never really liked hospitals, so she figured she was just a bit anxious, which was raising her heart rate. After waiting for hours in the emergency department, she finally saw the doctor who ordered some blood work and closely examined her legs. He noticed the rash and found some mild swelling in her legs. But what really stood out is that whenever he would touch her calves, she would be wincing in pain. And the level of pain seemed way out of proportion compared to the rash and the degree of swelling. So as a doctor, you're trained to think about the most deadly conditions first, the things that you absolutely cannot miss. And when it comes to leg swelling and severe pain, you have to think about a blood clot because if it's left untreated, the blood clot can travel up into the lungs and that can be fatal. Jennifer was sent for an ultrasound of her legs, which ended up being normal, no signs of a blood clot. Then she went for x-rays. Could there be something with the bones? Maybe a rapidly progressing infection or a fracture, maybe a tumor? Nope, nothing wrong with the bones or the joints. But the x-ray did show subcutaneous edema, which just means that there's fluid buildup, swelling in the tissue of her legs. Usually when I see leg swelling, I'm thinking about problems with three main organ systems, the heart, the liver, and the kidneys. But Jennifer's case doesn't fit those patterns. And the degree of pain far outweighs the amount of swelling, which really concerns me. Plus the rest of her physical exam and blood work doesn't go with heart failure, liver, or kidney disease. It's really unusual. So to better understand what's causing her pain and swelling, she went for an MRI of both her legs. This is what the cross section of her thighs looks like on MRI. See the white arrows pointing to that bright white area? That's abnormal fluid buildup in the skin and tissue. And the black arrows are pointing to the same thing happening in the deep fascia. Based on where the fluid is distributed in her leg and the amount of pain that she's in, it's most likely that this is all caused by an inflammatory process. But where is that inflammation coming from? Well, you certainly don't want to miss a hidden cancer. So the team ordered a CT scan of her chest, abdomen, and pelvis, which didn't show any signs of cancer. And the MRI of her legs didn't show a tumor, so we can pretty safely cross that one out. She wasn't in an accident and she doesn't have diabetes, which leaves infection and inflammation in the muscles as our top causes. Next, you went for an EMG, which is a test that measures the electrical activity produced by a muscle. These reports get super technical, but usually when there's muscle inflammation, there's something abnormal and it'll help us figure out the cause. But shockingly, this came back normal too. So Jennifer's in pain. The MRI shows inflammation, and yet we haven't been able to figure out the cause. So just like when you're working on one of those thousand piece jigsaw puzzles, if you get stuck in one corner, sometimes it's worth starting at the other corner and hoping that they'll connect. So with no answer to her leg pain, let's switch to a different clue that we have from her blood work, her anemia. So when she came to the hospital, her red blood cell levels were already low with a hemoglobin of 96. But alarmingly, while she's been in hospital for three days, her hemoglobin continued to drop from 96 down to 73. That's a pretty big drop. 
Now, when I approach a patient with anemia, one of the first things I look for is the size of the red blood cell, because this can be an important clue. For example, if you're low in iron, your red blood cells tend to be small. Whereas if you're low in vitamin B12, your red blood cells tend to be too big. In Jennifer's case, her red blood cells were a normal size, which is also useful information. And since her red blood cells are normal, you then wonder, well, is her body producing enough red blood cells? So her doctors ordered a special test called a reticulocyte count, which measures exactly this, how many new red blood cells are being made. And her reticulocyte count was high, which means that her bone marrow is doing the right thing by pumping out extra red blood cells to make up for her anemia. So this really narrows things down. If she's making enough red blood cells, then either she's bleeding somewhere and we just can't see it, or something is causing the red blood cells to break up and die early, which we call hemolysis. So blood tests were sent off to check for hemolysis, but those tests came back normal as well. Okay, so we can cross hemolysis off the list and now we're left with early blood loss. What is happening here? I mean, we can see that she's got some bruises on her legs, but there are no other signs of bleeding. And for a hemoglobin to drop by 20 points means you've actually lost quite a lot of blood. But where is it going? So for now, let's focus on her third and final clue, her rash. These little red dots are called petechiae and they're caused by red blood cells seeping out of the tiny little capillary blood vessels in her skin. That's interesting, right? I mean, she's got a rash that's caused by little blood vessels bleeding, and then she's also mysteriously losing large amounts of blood. These two things must be connected. So why would blood leak out of these tiny blood vessels? I think that it's either a problem with the blood vessels, so they're weak, or there's a problem clotting. So normally the cells and the proteins in your blood that form a blood clot and stop bleeding aren't working properly. Now, Jennifer's already had a lot of blood work done. So we're already able to cross off a lot of these conditions. Her platelet levels are actually a bit high, so that's not the issue. Her kidneys, liver, and clotting tests were all normal. And on physical exam, she doesn't have any signs of these genetic connective tissue diseases. The nice thing about rashes is that it's easy to take a sample of the skin and send it to the lab. So that's exactly what her doctors did. They did a skin punch biopsy with a kit like this. All you do is freeze the skin and then push down while turning this round blade and voila, you've got a sample ready to send off to the lab. And this will tell us if there's inflammation in the blood vessels like an autoimmune disease or a hidden infection but unfortunately, it takes days, even sometimes over a week, to get the results back. And we can't wait that long. If Jennifer's red blood cells continue to drop further, she's gonna start needing blood transfusions. Okay, so we may not know exactly what's going on, but we have done a lot of work to eliminate and rule out important causes. So now we have a relatively small list of potential causes. So it's time to go back and chat with Jennifer again, ask her detailed questions to try to get to the bottom of this. So when her doctors went back to speak with her, it happened to be around lunchtime, and they noticed that Jennifer left a lot of food on her tray and she wasn't touching it. So they asked her why. She explained that over the last two years, she's been worried about allergies and intolerances to foods. So slowly she's been restricting her diet and cutting out foods that she suspected were causing her issues. And at this point, she stopped eating all fruits and most vegetables without taking any new supplements. Suddenly, all the pieces start coming together and her symptoms can be explained by one rare diagnosis, one that many people assume is a thing of the past. And that scurvy from vitamin C deficiency. Thinking back, we can explain all of Jennifer's symptoms. She first became fatigued. And there are a few theories about how vitamin C plays into this. Vitamin C is needed to create L-carnitine, which turns fat into energy called ATP. So Jennifer's body literally had less energy to work with. Plus, vitamin C is involved in creating norepinephrine, which is very similar to adrenaline, which gives you that fight or flight response. Then there's the bruising and the rashes on her skin. Your body needs vitamin C to make collagen. And collagen is this critical structural support for so many things, like your skin, blood vessels, muscles, bone, cartilage. Just imagine how vitamin C deficiency wreaks havoc on your body. So without vitamin C to make strong collagen, blood vessels become weak and they start to bleed easily, which is how you get bruising and that distinct petechial rash that we saw on Jennifer. Tiny blood vessels heading to the knees also get affected, which explains her joint pains. 
Now, looking back at the MRI of her legs, we can connect the dots. So scurvy leads to abnormal connective tissue, and that causes the fascia, the tissue, and the muscle to bleed. And our body does not like blood in those areas, so it leads to this huge inflammatory response. And part of that is fluid buildup, and that's what we saw in the MRI. And all that inflammation from the blood caused the pain. It also explains why her hemoglobin kept dropping and why her blood work suggested she had early blood loss even though we couldn't see her losing blood anywhere. So at this point you might be wondering, but wait, why couldn't we see the blood on the MRI? I was actually wondering the same thing. It's probably because all this blood was distributed over such a large area throughout her legs, so it didn't get picked up on the MRI. Whereas if she had bled all into one area, we would definitely have been able to see it. And all of our suspicions were confirmed with one blood test, her vitamin C level, which was actually so low that the hospital lab couldn't give a specific number. It just said less than 10. So now we've confirmed her diagnosis of scurvy. Is that what you were thinking? Or did that surprise you? Let me know in the comments below. Now, I bet when you're thinking of scurvy, your mind goes to pirates and sailors getting sick, right? What you may not know is that it's actually one of the oldest diseases in human history. The Egyptians actually wrote about this 3,000 years ago, and they even recommended eating onions and vegetables to cure the condition. Like, what? I'm continuously amazed by the ancient Egyptians. It totally blows my mind. <laughs> Now, fast forward to the 1500s when the sailors are setting out to explore the world, often going months without fresh fruit and vegetables. Scurvy went from being a rare condition to one that killed millions of sailors. And doctors drew diagrams of the classic symptoms, bruises, rashes, gums that were bleeding, and teeth falling out. Some people clued into the helpful effects of citrus fruit, but nobody actually proved it until Sir James Lynn did in 1700s. Okay, so here's where I nerd out a little bit, so bear with me. He did what we consider to be the first ever clinical trial. Little did he know this would be the start of how we do medical research today. So he took 12 sailors, divided them up into groups of two, and gave them each different treatments. I gotta say, I feel really badly for the men who were given the elixir of vitriol, which is drinking sulfuric acid three times per day. Ugh. So as you might have guessed, Team Oranges and Lemons did extremely well, and he published his findings. What I find really fascinating is that back then, they didn't even know what vitamins were. They didn't even have a concept of them. So they just knew it was something in oranges and lemons that cured the disease. So with such a long history of scurvy and the advent of modern medicine, you'd think that scurvy would be a thing of the past. But most recent studies actually suggest that 5% of all Americans and an alarming 18% of American smokers have a vitamin C level less than 11. Like, that is shocking. That means there are millions of people at high risk of developing symptoms of scurvy. And those numbers are even higher in low and middle income countries. So how much vitamin C do you actually need? For women, it's 75 milligrams a day, and for men, it's 90. But if you smoke, you need extra. So add 35 milligrams a day on top of that. And just remember, your body isn't good at storing vitamin C. So you need to get some each day. And it's surprisingly easy to get your total daily needs. Like for me, I would just have to have one quarter of a red bell pepper. Not bad. Or one orange. Maybe three quarters of a cup of raw broccoli. <laughs> oh, and a fun fact that most people don't know is that vitamin C breaks down at high heat. Plus, if you're boiling vegetables, vitamin C can get lost in the cooking water. So if you're like me and you're planning to cook some broccoli for dinner tonight, then consider steaming or microwaving it because that's how you're gonna get the most vitamin C out of it. But before you start popping back vitamin C's like candies, remember that too much of a good thing can also be a problem. For most of us, if we get too much vitamin C, we just pee it out. So don't worry about chowing down on bell peppers. But if you're someone who gets kidney stones, particularly calcium oxalate stones, then high vitamin C levels can actually cause you to form even more stones. Vitamin C also increases iron absorption from plant-based sources, which is great for vegetarians, but not so good if your body already has too much iron, like people with hemochromatosis or sickle cell disease, where you really don't wanna be taking too much vitamin C. So safest thing to do is to talk to your doctor if you're unsure or if you have any of those conditions. So you're probably wondering, what happened to our patient? Well, she was started on vitamin C supplementation and within 24 hours, she already felt better with more energy. And by 48 hours, her bruises were already starting to improve. Over the next few months, her body started making normal collagen. It repaired the blood vessels and stopped all the bleeding. Her anemia 
joint pain, leg pain, and a rash is all completely resolved. It's such an easy and cheap fix. And yet, without vitamin C, people die from infections, bleeding, and even sudden cardiac death. So reflecting on this case, it really makes me think how important it is for healthcare providers to ask people about their diets. Something I don't think we do enough of in medicine. It also highlights how careful we need to be when it comes to restrictive diets, because it can lead to micronutrient deficiencies that we may not even be aware of. Speaking of restrictive diets, if you're interested in learning about how a 21-year-old man had a restrictive diet that caused brain damage, then let me recommend you check out this video next. And if you want to learn more about this particular case, check out the published case report in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. I'll leave the link below in the description. I also want to thank my friend, Dr. Ravi Shurgill, a radiologist who collaborated on this video. And with that, be sure to subscribe and make sure that notification bell is turned on, so that way I'll see you in the next video. So, bye for now! Thank <laughs> you.